This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Columbus. Thanks for being with us. Honored to be joined today by Jim Lavelle. He's a veteran of the United States Navy, survivor of Pearl Harbor, and uh, as you may know already, he was very much present at the uh, assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald in 1963. We'll get to that in a moment. Sir, you were just talking about the heroism uh, at Pearl Harbor and so many different acts that it's hard to even list them all. Once the attack had ended, what was the what was going on in your mind? What was going on? What was the general sense aboard? Was it just the attack about what was to come? What was going on? Well, everybody had had been drilled on the fact that if something like that happened, they would be a landing follower it. And see, the U.S. did that same thing after the war got going. They bombed these islands real good before the ships went in. And it was a common battle practice. So. And, and every sailor and, and uh, marine and so forth was familiar with that. And of course, uh, most of us, uh, uh, of course, the, the uh, uh, well, I, well, I can't think of his name now, but the uh, boatswain mate that was standing up there with me when the first plane came in, uh, he, uh, that's the first thing he thought of, and I uh, and mentioned it, and, and so that every, I think I think he I think he put it out over the general alarm system, too, that we might be uh, have a ground uh, ground invasion later, because that was a normal thing to do. You bomb bomb the shore uh, facilities or whatever they have, and then you come in with a ground invasion. So that's what we was all looking for. That's uh, that's what we'd been taught and so that's what we look for and but fortunately they didn't have that and uh, they didn't follow it up well they wasn't prepared to anyway and as it turned out but, uh, that's what that's what we was all looking forward to and being alerted to and at the same time try to cure the, the problems that we had such as the damage to the some of the ships were hopeless we had there was two destroyers, the case and something else in dry dock, uh, along with the Pennsylvania the battleship, and they all got uh, well. In fact, those two two of those destroyers, whatever it was, there they they didn't even try to repair them. They were damaged so bad that they uh, just used them for parts uh, for the other destroyers. If they had if they was a good part on it that they could use on one of the other destroyers, they got hurt. Uh, so it, uh, the uh, um, I, uh, I can't think of anything else about along that line there. But then they that was what uh, uh, what followed up. You did what you had to do is what it amounted to. You know, what, what what the first thing to come in that you could do and help for. That's exactly what was taking place. The the uh, the sailors and all of that uh, they didn't have to be told what to do they they could see what needed to be done and they did it so it was a great uh, uh, appreciation and so forth that they, everyone did follow that and not stop and gawk and look and see what's going on how soon were you able to get back out and go back to what you had been doing and well, well, the next day uh, after the after we got rid of the destroyers that was tied up to us, we went we uh, went back over in, uh, next to Pearl uh, to uh, the island and uh, uh, Ford Island. These ships that was uh, badly damaged, and uh, one of them uh, I forgot the name of it. It, it was a cruiser. Uh, it was named after a city out of Missouri. Uh, that much I remember. And all of their, their entire electrical power was knocked out. Well, we had full electrical power, and uh, so we pulled in there beside it and uh, run lines over to them so their electricians could hook up, and we stayed with them until they got all of their stuff running, and then we moved on to another one. And so that's what we did for a while to, to get the others back in sh into running condition. And then for the remainder of the war, did you 
stay in the Whitney? Did you keep doing the well, same? Well, I, was, I, I, was, no, I wasn't too long after that. Uh, the, the doctor told me that uh, they weren't, after, that, I, I, after being that, uh, getting hurt at sea by that typhoon, he, he said, well, I can't, I've done all I can do for you, so uh, we're going to ship you back to the States. And so uh, about the middle of uh, December or something like that, why we uh, I ended up back on the state side, and then eventually uh, they sent me down to Corona, California, where the Navy had taken over a uh, country club down there and made a, a hospital out of it for uh, uh, for uh, people that were injured and needed a little uh, time to get well and so forth, and. So when I got when I got that arrived down there, they had a full complement of doctors and nurses and the corpsmen, but they didn't have many patients yet because they had just opened. I think I was about the 15th or 20th when it showed up down there. So I had plenty of nurses and doctors to take care of, help me out. And but of course, they were bringing people in nearly every day too, uh, from uh, that had been wounded in the battles elsewhere and what have you. And uh, eventually they got a pretty good complement of uh, patients and so forth. But uh, I stayed there and they never, and the, the chief doctor, uh, uh, he and I, after I got to where I could get around good, I tried to get him to t send me back to sea and he wouldn't do it. And he said, no, I won't authorize you to go back to sea. And uh, he, Finally, he just told me, he said, I'll, I'll okay you for shore duty. I said, well, I don't want shore duty. I want to go back to sea. And he said, I'm not going to do that right now. He said, I think you'll break down. I don't think you, you'll last. And uh, so he and I had a lot of little arguments about that. And uh, of course, he won. And uh, he had the authority. But uh, later on in uh, the... Uh, Air Force, United States Air Force, came into uh, there and was going to build a huge warehouse to f handle all the parts that they would need in, the, in uh, any of their planes that they had, fighter planes, bombers, and so forth. And uh, they, because at that time, the uh, way he explained it to me was that uh, maybe one of those planes needed a certain part. And they had to look for it because they couldn't go to one place and find it. And uh, some place that might have had it at one time didn't have it now. Some other plane had got it or something. So they was going to build a warehouse there and did that handled everything that all of their planes needed. And so if anything, uh, uh, if they needed something, they just sent it. They know where to go to go to get it. Uh, well, I would have shortened the story. Uh, the commander uh, opening that deal, they had problems getting enough employees to, because a lot of the younger men had gone signed up to, to go to war. And they c came over, and uh, of course my rank was a storekeeper, I, uh, supplies was what I handled. And they came over and asked the, uh, the chief doctor if they had, if he had anybody that was with uh, supply experience, maybe getting out that they might hire. And so who was they sick them all, sick them on me, said, well, Lavelle is eligible for a discharge if he wants it. And because uh, he wants to go to sea and I can't authorize it because I don't think he'd hold up out there very long in the bucking sea, uh, rough weather. And uh, he said, but he's eligible for a discharge if he wants to take it. So they come, I was making $36 a month. So they come and talk to me and ask me about taking a discharge and coming to work for them. And uh, so they, when I, I, they told me, of course they knew how much money I was making. They said, well, if you'll take your discharge and come over and we can hire you as a civilian, we'll pay you $125 a month. So I wasn't too good at arithmetic, but I could figure out the difference between 30 and 125. And, I, and it's basically the same thing you'd be doing in shore duty as uh, ashore. Uh, and uh, so I talked about it, and, and I have, at that time I was uh, keeping company with one of the nurses pretty close, and 
uh, when I asked her, asked her about uh, my decision if I took it, and I said if I don't like it, then I'll go back to my home and see what I can do. And I asked her if she'd like to go with me. And she, we were down walking down by the lake, and she took about two steps and said, "Yeah, I believe I would." So that's how I got engaged, and then she, we did get married. And it lasted 72 years. I just lost her this uh, October a year ago. And uh, that, uh, I, I went and worked with them for about a year and a half, and then I took another job up in the Sierras for a while, and then I had to go back to the hospital. So uh, when I left that, I went after went back to the Naval Hospital in, in Arizona. And when they released me there, I, I went on back uh, down to here, to Texas, uh, and well, not here, but down in Texas, and visit my family a while, and then I went back to Dallas and went to work for the federal government as a auditor and uh, uh, and some of their deals. And sir, and let's then, let's, then, let's pause right there. Uh, I guess I think you're about to tell us about your joining the police department. So we'll yeah. pick up that story in just a moment on Veterans Chronicles.